my friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa Stringworks Workshop, and I have a visitor in the shop. His name is Michael Landreth, and he brought me a Fender mandolin to take a look at. We're going to do a full meal deal set up on this thing and see what we can do to improve it. Looks like it's in pretty good shape. I've already done a cursory look at it, and everything looks really good to me. Um, we can improve it a little bit. This saddle is, uh, it's just not a real good quality, uh, to be blunt about it. It's, it, it appears to be an ebony, but it, you know, I kind of think it may just be a dyed, uh, wood or a black wood dyed or something else because I can see the grain pattern in it. And typically you don't see the grain pattern in, in, um, ebony, in real ebony. Um, so it, it looks kind of grainy is what I'm saying. So that, therefore it doesn't look like it's real ebony to me. And the base is kind of the same way. However, the base does fit the top perfectly, which is kind of unusual. You don't usually see that. Usually that there's always something wrong, <laughs> but that looks really good I actually. I learned from you on that, by the way. Pardon me? I learned from you on that. The way oh, you, you learned, sand it, you yes. learned how, You learned to sand yeah, it the I, way. I, yeah, I probably, there you go. Hopefully I did a good job. Yeah, it so. looks good. It looks really good. Um, yeah, overall it looks really nice. Here's a close-up of the fretboard there, the inlay. And there's the peg head. I'm trying to think of which uh, maker made this shape peg head to there. Isn't it Monteleone or somebody that did that? I don't know. Made a peg head that same shape. I'm not really sure. And there's the back and the sides. The sides have a more curly maple than the back. The back's got some curl in it, but it's not real pronounced. But you can see the curl in the sides even more. But we'll uh, get started on this and see what we can do. I have started taking the strings off the uh, Fender mandolin here. Now, these strings could be fooling me. They could be, I guess, the silk and steel, but they they look like, from the tarnish that I see on them, they look like they're the old nickel strings. And nickel strings aren't too bad. Sometimes they sound real good, too. But um, anyway, I think we'll be able to uh, improve it quite a bit here. The um, strings are kind of tied on, makes them a little difficult to get out off put through the hole a couple of times is what it is and it makes it a little difficult to get them out. I'll show you my next step here when I get to it. On this mandolin now that I have the strings off of it one of the first things I'm going to do is use this little pad of felt that he's got here and I'm going to insert that under this because this is actually riding on the top and you know, that's not a good thing. It's going to cause some kind of a vibration or noise or something at some point in time. Or it could, let's just say it that way. And this, by putting a little bit of piece of this under there, and uh, that should stop that problem. Now, the only problem I see with that is getting it under there because it's pretty tight to the top. And I'm not sure I can get it under there. Yeah, I can't. I just kind of horse it up and put it in there like that. Now I don't want to be able to see it too easily so I'm going to try to force it under there a little bit more. Although I think the uh, top here will cover that up. Yeah actually I think that's good enough. It, it'll cover it up and I, I'm, I'm deep enough in there so you won't see it. He's already got this filled, so this part's fine. We won't have to do that. We will do something here on this side. And this material he's got is very good. I like it. Um, so I think maybe what I'll do is, is, put a, is put some kind of a glue on here and stick this to there. And uh, I think that will work just fine. So I think that's what I'll do. So I'm going to try this uh, Gorilla Glue. This is the clear Gorilla Glue. Bonds virtually everything, it says. Well, this is virtually everything right here. Or it potentially could be. 
I'm just wondering if it hasn't already bonded itself to the bottle. That may be what the problem is with this. Actually, I see it moving around in there. So we'll take a little bit out, probably with a toothpick or something. Looks like it's fine otherwise, and I'll just take enough here to do it, do the job off of a toothpick. This is pretty good glue as, as glues go. This seems to stick really well for the unique jobs that I do. I don't use it for a lot of things, but for unique things like this, it seems like a good choice. We'll stick that in place and let that start doing its thing as far as setting up and it'll probably be ready to go by the time I'm ready to put the strings back on it. Looking at the fretboard real close, I will be the first to tell you that these frets have been filed a couple of times it looks like. Um, you know, potentially we could refret it. That would take some time and effort. Um, I think it's right on the edge of needing a fret job, but I think we've got one more uh, filing in these, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try that. I always try to do the simple thing first. One thing I noticed is the ends are sticking out. I'm gonna file those off a little bit. I I've noticed it um, dragging right here, and this fret here is really shiny. This one is too. Looking down the fingerboard, it's really flat, so I don't think we have any problems, issues with the truss rod or anything. The only fret that's not being fouled is right here in this spot and right here. Now it looks like this is the only one that's not being fouled, but it's just barely not being fouled, I can tell. I think that looks pretty good. I'm going to try to recrown them now and see how that goes. And if that goes okay, then we're probably fine. These files had been made really flat, so I'm trying to get the curve back into the top of them. And that's why I'm rocking the fret file a little bit. Looking at them real close there and it, they all look real nice and round again. I don't see any problems with any of them. So to me, I think it's a smart idea not to uh, replace them at this time. And uh, you know, when you're paying a high rate per hour, it, that's a good thing. It saves a lot of money. So there you go. I think it's just fine the way it is. I, I would prefer to keep them low myself. They play better, I think. I think the whole mandolin plays better. It feels better without having to press so far. But uh, I think it's gonna be just fine or I would replace them. I've got a fine piece of wet or dry sandpaper now and I'm gonna go over these frets. And uh, I think this is the right thing to do to your frets. It really gets rid of any sharpness. Uh, it rounds them all off, makes them all look exactly the same. Yes, you can do this the, this direction on each fret and achieve a very good job that way too, but this is much faster and achieves the exact same result. You, you couldn't tell that I did them this way versus the other way, I promise you. Even, I doubt you could even tell under high-powered microscope. It does not leave grooves in the press, contrary to some of the people that like to say that. I promise you, those frets are slicker than snot on a doorknob right now. They're, as a matter of fact, they are so slick, you, you can just feel it. It's just amazing. Now, that does kind of scuff up the fretboard though. 
which is perfectly fine with me because I was planning to level that anyway, scrape it down. So we're going to do that next. These are the little bit thicker than average single edge razor blades. And these blades will typically cut the mother of pearl also. Now this is doesn't appear to be pearl actually. I'm not sure what that material is. It's it doesn't look like real pearl, so I would assume it's a plastic or something like that. In my opinion, scraping these fingerboards like this is a good thing. It typically gets rid of the cheap look that a lot of them have. They often put some kind of a cheap looking glazing on them. This will take it back down to bare wood and then we can oil it and it'll look real nice and rich. One more benefit of scraping the fingerboard like that is that it, uh, it, you know, raises the frets just a tiny bit. Not very much, just a few thousands, but hey, every little bit counts. So where those frets were low before, now they feel like they're just about right to me. I don't feel like there's any problem at all. Let you see that up close now. And now we'll put the uh, oil on it. Put a couple of drops of this on there and then I'll just spread it around. And now one more look at it looks really nice looks just almost like brand new now so about as good as it gets on that type of thing I feel like those frets are absolutely perfect that should make for a nice low setup and I think what I'll do um, before I get to the setup is I think I'll just take it over to the buffer and clean it up real good I'm not going to show that but that's what I'm going to do and I'll show you what it looks like when I get done with that I've buffed this whole top and back and sides. Looks really nice. I also wiped the peg head real nice by hand, but I didn't buff that because I'd have to take the tuning keys off. So overall, I think this looks real good. I think I'm going to apply some wax to it and then we'll start setting it up. One of the secrets to putting wax on like this, this paste wax, is to keep your rag turned all the time. If you, if, you, if you don't, you can't get this wax off. So keep your rag turning all the time and it comes off much better and it buffs it out much better too. So, you know, just use it for a short time in the position you have it in and then turn it around and move it a little bit, fold it over a different way. That's very important if you really want to get a good shine and get the wax off. See, look at that thing. Look at that thing shine. Again, it's slicker than snot on a doorknob. If you laid that on your lap now, it would slide right off, I guarantee you. So, I think we're ready to start setting this baby up. We'll see how it goes. Well, upon close inspection of this bridge, first thing I notice is for sure it is not ebony. As I told you, I could see the grain in it. When you can see the grain pattern in the side of a bridge or saddle, you can pretty much bet it's not ebony. And as I turn it over, you can see it's a brown wood. Now, I also under closer inspection see that it's cracked right here 
and right here. Now the reason for that is, first of all, it's, a, it's not hard enough kind of wood, but second of all, notice how little material it sets above these tuning uh, buttons here, these adjusters. There's very little wood there. So you, you know, even though this bridge is, or this saddle is this thick, really the only strength is coming straight across here. So that's all the strength that that has. This, the bottom up part of that, believe it or not, it's just decoration. It's not really supporting anything, especially once that crack starts. Once that crack starts, it's, this bottom part is totally just decoration. So the customer's not here to ask right now. So my, Mr. Landreth is, I think he's out getting some lunch. But uh, I'm going to make an executive decision to replace this whole thing because while it fits the top really well, it's just not the best kind of bridge and saddle. So I'm just going to set that aside and start from scratch. And I think he'll be happier since he's wanting the full meal deal. That's what I think the full meal deal consists of is doing everything that it really needs to uh, make it a little bit better. And one more little thing about this bridge and saddle that uh, these colorblind eyes noticed, <laughs> thank goodness, it's silver, but you notice the rest of this mandolin is gold. So it really ought to be gold anyway. Fortunately, had one in stock. So, and you notice how much more dainty this bridge is. See how much more slim line. These are what I call clunky bridges. And because they're clunky, they eat up a lot of your sound. You want to transfer all that sound into your top. This higher quality ebony will do a much better job transferring that sound into the top. And uh, anyway, that's where we're headed with this. I'm preparing a uh, antler saddle for the uh, new bridge. And that'll just give the instrument a little bit more bark. And I think that's going to be a good thing. And again, the, the antler doesn't dampen the transit, uh, the um, vibrations also. I mean, that's the big thing about the antler is that it lets those vibrations get right on through to, down into the wood. I'm just cleaning up the saw marks if you're wondering what I'm doing here. So there's what she looks like. And then I take and clean up the bottom too where the adjusters sit. Because they're basically just rough sawn. And the last thing I do, even though it doesn't make it play any better, is I usually brand them with my label here. Unfortunately on camera, I don't know if I'm going to get that done because it's, uh, I normally do it on the table. Yep, it worked. So I just put my label on there. And then the final thing I do is I label on each side which string goes where. So this, this is the E side over here and this is the G side over here. And so I just put that little label on there also. And you might wonder how do I know the difference? The bevel on both sides is the G. The bevel on the front edge is the E. And that's kind of equivalent to the angle of the saddle on a guitar. It puts this out in front of the bass strings. So it's basically the same thing. Okay. I think I'm ready to move on to the next step. I uh, got the uh, saddle fitted on top of this new bridge. Unfortunately, this doesn't fit at all. It rocks like grandma's rocking chair. It, it's really not even close. That's sad. I, I, I like it when they're closer than that. Uh, typically they are closer than that. It's just a, a uniquely shaped top, I guess. So what I'm gonna do is just take a pencil and just kind of trace the shape there. And then I'm going to go over to my sander and sand, you know, closer to that profile so that the, the profile will be much closer. Um, I don't expect to get it perfect, but I can get it close. 
done a lot of shaping on this off camera. I took it over to my spindle sander and knocked out the real high areas. And then I've been scraping it with the single edge blade to get rid of some more. And I just put the sandpaper on here just before I turned the camera on. And that's starting to get us close now. It really is a quite unique shape on this top of this. Quite different than what I normally see. But we are getting close. But honestly, we got quite a ways to go yet. It's starting to look pretty good now. It's got a ways to go still though. It's in the ballpark. I've seen worse than this now, let's say it that way. It was pretty bad when I first set it on here though. I'm gonna go over to the spindle sander, knock out a little bit of this middle. And I'll be right back. I've got that saddle fitting pretty well, and of course, by doing that, um, it, you know, it kind of scuffs up the top just a little bit. So yeah. I'm going to clean that up with some wax, and I think it'll be fine. Well, I think that looks pretty good. So. I'm about ready to start stringing it up. Well, my friends, I'm at the point where I'm ready to put the strings on this, and I've chosen the uh, GHS Silk and Steel for this mandolin. I think they're going to do a good job for him. And uh, Michael Landreth is sitting here, and we got to talking about different things, and the national number system came up, and Michael's got some thoughts on it. I thought maybe he could share them with you and then that way you don't hear it just from me, you know, because I don't, you know, I get the feeling sometimes people think I'm making things up or, or just pushing the hard sell, you know, but then again, I hear it from other people too. So here you go. Michael, tell them what you think about it. Well, the National Number System is a very good system from anywhere from the beginner to the professional player. It takes, for the beginner, it takes any instrument and it answers that one question that ate me up for years and everybody, and that is, what chord goes with what chord? I said for years I knew how to play the chords, I just didn't know where they went to, and the Nashville number system takes care of that. On the mandolin, and Jerry's lesson that he has, video lesson that he has, is very precise, it's very good, it's probably one of the best lessons I've ever gotten on a video. It's to the point and uh, he leaves really nothing out and if you get it you'll be playing a mandolin in no time if you pay attention to what he says. Well good, I'm glad to hear that. I, You know, um, what I tell people and I may even say it in the lesson is that once you really understand the number system and think in the number system, and I don't mean, you know, like doing the count thing on your hand and all that stuff that a lot of people know and do. That's totally different. Once you do it the way I think about it and explain it in the training, um, the, as soon as someone says the key of the song, you instantly know all the chords that are in there. I mean, instantly. It's not like you have to think about it. You just be it's because it's done by shape. It's done by pattern. There's only two patterns once you learn the two patterns You got it down there. It's just that simple yeah. so to me Why they don't teach it in school and why that's not the way they teach music I don't know because it's way simpler. It's very true. It is very simple. Yeah, it's I don't, I, yeah, I don't even get the idea of why they go through the, all that complicated <laughs> stuff that they teach them. I, you know, don't get me wrong. I think learning notation and all that is excellent. But I don't think that's the way you should start learning the music. I think that should be the secondary part of your uh, training, you know. I think you learn it this other way first, and then you go, oh, it's so simple. And then you start getting into that complicated stuff to add to your knowledge, you know. Now, I don't know... The, that complicated stuff. I'll just be honest with you. I don't know it. But then again, I don't feel like I'm missing too much either. <laughs> so, and we don't need it too much in bluegrass and country. So it and, works out real good for me. And another thing too, don't be fooled by the name. 
the Nashville Number System started in country and old rock and roll, but it covers rock, jazz, pop, you name it. Yeah. It's, it covers yeah. it. Yeah, people ask me all the time, will it work on a piano? Will it work on this? It Everything. really works. It's it's more of an understanding of music is really what it boils down to. It works on any kind of music, pretty much. It's it's just an understanding of how things work together. And and the another key thing that I think is really cool about it, and for years I always thought music was complicated. And because I couldn't see those patterns that I'm talking about. The instant I started thinking in numbers, then I started seeing patterns. And it's like, the patterns are there. You can't see them when you're thinking in letters. They don't show up because every time you change keys, all of the letters change. Where it doesn't matter what key you're in, the numbers stay the same. And therefore, you start to see the patterns. There's only a handful of patterns. I mean, even when you get down to individual songs, there's like what I call a pivot pattern where you go like from one to four, one to five, one to four, one to five. That's kind of like a pivot pattern. You're pivoting around the one. Then there's a circle pattern where you go one, four, five, one, four, five, one, four, five. I mean, there's those. Now that's a different kind of pattern than I'm talking about on the chord pattern itself. There's only two patterns you need to learn on the mandolin, but I'm talking about song patterns now. You never saw those song patterns when you're thinking in letters because all the letters change every time you change keys. So it, it's really worth learning. It really is. I, I don't care who you are. If you don't know it, you really ought to know it. Even if you're already an advanced player, you should learn the national number system. Yeah. And it, it's for, um, it's really for chords. So any instruments that you're going to play chords on from the piano to the ukulele to the mandolin to the banjo. Yep. Even the bass, even though you're not normally going to be playing chords on it, strumming them. If we're in C, you go to F, go to G. On the bass, you're going to be going da 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 da, and then to F, and then to G. So by knowing the Nashville number system, you know where you're going to go. And uh, my friend Bruce down in Mississippi, he he his biggest benefit, according to him, is that it helped him change keys faster because yeah. he plays in church and like. They'll practice something in one key and then go on stage and do it in a different key, you know, he says. And therefore, you know, it, it, instantly he knows where to go with his chords because, you know, the, the number system, the, it all stays relative from where you start. It's, it's hard to explain that all in just a couple seconds, but it becomes very obvious once you actually get into it and learn it. And where that started at, too, was uh, one of the Jordanaires, my understanding, was in a studio and he found that they would hand out sheet music to everybody, all the players, and the song would be, let's say, in the key of C. Well, the artist would come in that they were recording for and say, I don't want to do that and say I want to do it in G or whatever key. So they had to pick up all the papers, go back to the copyist, have them redo it. Right. And he brought up the fact that it's all the same, no matter what key you're in. And so then he started writing key of G, one slash 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 four or five etc and yeah they saved a lot of time and even still today in nashville and other studios they do not talk in cfg gcd they talk in the one and then i need to do this on the four right. and the five yeah it's really handy it it really is it's it's like shortcut to uh playing music and it just i don't know and to me Whoever designed it, and I don't know who it was, like he's yeah. talking Jordan Airs there. Whoever designed it, it, to me, it's like they designed it on the mandolin. Yeah. <laughs> because when you teach it on the mandolin, it just makes all kinds of sense. And then once, then once you understand it on the mandolin, then you can transfer it to a guitar or anything. Yeah. And it, it makes perfect sense then. Yeah, it's made perfect for the mandolin. It, it really is. Really is yeah. it, it really seems to be the best on the mandolin. Although it works perfectly fine on a guitar and all that too. It's just that it's easier to fully picture and understand it, I think, on the mandolin. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, that's all I wanted to uh, let you hear him say it, you know, because sometimes when somebody says it differently, it might make more sense to you, you know. So I hope you got something out of that. And I'm getting something out of this mandolin here. We're just about to get the strings on it. I got three more or two and a half more to go here. And it'd be easy if it was 
simple, but it's just not. <laughs> it's simple, but it's complicated. I'm trying. We're getting there. Almost got it. So I'll bring you back here in just a minute when we're ready to play this thing. Well, I've got this thing set up just as perfect as it can be set up, and I, you know, I say that, and it it sounds bragging, but uh, it's the truth. You couldn't you couldn't get it any better. It's uh, we've lowered it at the nut here too, so that I mean, like I, I don't know if you can see that, but watch me press this down, and you won't see it move. I mean, that's how low it is. You just don't see it move, and yet it doesn't buzz. You know, it plays perfectly. You couldn't do it any better, and you know. And again, I don't say that to brag. I mean, it's just that's as good as it gets right there. Now we can make it one step better than this yet, and the customer is all in on this, and that is taking this finish off this neck. Now, you know, I wouldn't recommend you do this unless you've done a lot of this kind of thing in your life, because you can sure make this thing look like a mess in a hurry, and uh, you'll be wishing you hadn't done this. So I'm not recommending that anybody try this at home, but you, you proceed at your own risk. You've been warned. <laughs> I thought about this thing before I came down. Yeah. I said, eh, I better not. It's not easy. It really isn't. Okay, so, you know, there ain't no pretty way to do this. It's ugly all the way. So here we go. I've got a scraper and I am just going to start peeling this off. And I hope it's not fiberglass because I've run into that on some instruments. It almost smells like it, but I think it's a I think it's a water-based lacquer or something maybe. It's a hard finish, really hard. It might be It might be a resin. It's hard to tell. It's got a it's got a unique smell and it's very very hard. I was hoping it would just be a a lacquer cuz lacquer I can peel those off pretty quick. Yeah, bummer. It's a little harder than lacquer, I can tell you that for sure. Yeah, this is really hard stuff. <laughs> you would not be happy if you started this at home right now. I would, it'd be hard to, comp to explain how hard this is. This really is a hard, hard, hard finish. In fact, it's so hard I may have to sharpen my scraper. Ordinarily, just a couple of scrapes, I'm down to bare wood. I'm only down to bare wood in a few places already. That's not a good sign. I kind of wish I kind of wish I would have known how hard this was going to be. You just don't know till you start in on them. And you know, you might say, "Well, you know, it's a, a fender. You should know." Well, no. They don't do the same thing on every one of them, trust me. You'd be surprised how often they change. Finishes change all kinds of things. So, you never know until you know. But you know me, I'll get it eventually. Instead of 30 minutes though, it might be an hour. Because I could have done it in 30 minutes if it had been a simple finish. Well, looky here. Michael gave me a big old antler to boot. <laughs> My goodness, this is awesome. This is a mule deer uh, shed or a rack, I can tell. Um, this was a harvested deer. In other words, it was probably shot. The reason I say that is because it's been sawn off here and mounted. Um, so I'm sure it was somebody's trophy at one time or another. It's a, but it definitely is a mule deer, I believe. And you can kind of tell that by the forks here, for one thing. Yeah, huge, huge. <laughs> you know, as big as my hand is, uh, yeah, it's that's a stretch to go all the way around that. That's pretty amazing how big that is. That's a big one. That'll make a lot of good uh, saddles. Um, th to be honest, this one's so big, it may not work as well for the mandolins as it will for the guitars. But it'll work great for guitars, for sure, and perhaps for mandolin as well. Uh, it really depends. The bigger they are, 
the more porous they are. Uh, nature takes care of the weight by making them more porous, you know, when they get bigger. But uh, it's an awesome rack. It really is. So thank you, Michael. I appreciate well, it. Well, it's a tough fight, Maul, but I am winning. I'm going to get there eventually. I'm still working on this area up here. Because this is such a hard finish, I've decided to just round it off right here rather than take it all the way back because get inside in those cracks would just be that much harder. Um, it's hard on a normal finish. It would be nearly impossible on this finish. This is seriously a hard, hard, hard finish. I am sure it's some sort of an epoxy resin. I don't know for sure what specifically it is, but it's, it's, it's definitely some kind of an epoxy resin. I am positive of that. It's harder than a brick bat, as my dad would have said. And I don't even know what a brick bat is. Well, I'll show you what it looks like when I get a little further along. My friends, it was a tough fight, but I got the finish off of that neck. <laughs> wow, was that hard to do. It was one of the hardest I've ever done. It just wouldn't come off. This finish, whatever this stuff is, and I'm pretty sure it's an epoxy of some sort, and, and I'm basing that mostly on the smell. Um, it doesn't smell like fiberglass. It smells more like, you know, epoxy or something like that. A very hard resin. But uh, anyway, it came off. The neck looks really nice, I think, uh, all things considered. And it's just as slick as it can be. The, the advantage of having a bare neck is that your hand doesn't, you know, like when you rub it across here, it's kind of like it just goes ba -ba 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 bounces, like it just kind of sticks and, and moves, you know. But here, it's just as slick as snot on a doorknob, you know. It just it moves so good. It's just, it's amazing. So it really does improve your playability of your instrument to have a bare neck. So I've got that all fixed up. Let's just see what it sounds like. Play, plays like a dream. It couldn't play any better. And to be perfectly honest, and I've already talked to the customer about this, I was hoping to get a little bit more volume out of it. Um, I tell you what that is, it's, it's two things. One of them is that finish, that, that super dense, heavy finish is, you know, quite honestly, it's just kind of like a blanket and it's killing the sound a little bit. The other thing is that it does have uh, the bracing in it is a little bit heavy, a little bit chubby. Um, but, uh, but it's mostly the finish, I think, it's really what it is. Bill Monroe. And uh, we're going to do one more thing on camera here to, uh, to close this out. And that is we're going to make a strap for this. And I haven't really shown my technique for making my simple straps. They are simple. Some of you will not like it at all. That's okay. You don't have to like it. I, I like a simple, simple strap for a mandolin. And the reason being uh, it's easy to put it in the case. You know, you can put a big thick leather strap or some padded strap or whatever, and then you've got to spend five minutes folding it into the case. This, the kind of strap I make, you just throw this in the case, shut the lid, you're done. It's just that simple. So here we go, and I'll show you how I do it. I make it out of a simple paracord, just like this. And the way I do this is I pull, I make a loop like so. I, I leave plenty of, of the tail hanging out here. Then I, I loop back again. So you've really just got two loops like so. Then I start wrapping and basically we're just making a hangman's noose if you know what a hangman's noose is. And I just start wrapping like so. Wrapping back toward the other loop. And I like to get five or six wraps, something like that. There's about one, two, three, four, five, and we're on our sixth. So I'll just kind of go around and come back through for the sixth one there. And then all you do is you find the one that 
you pull on this side that gets rid of the loop on the other end and that's what I'm doing there so I'm pulling that loop out and I just pulled it up tight and that held it right there see now this then I can pull through here and now that'll close the hangman's noose if you will very simple then I put that on here now I always do the tail end first and uh, put it on the tail end right there and and that because that tightens up like a hangman's noose trust me that won't come loose that's there for the you know to stay now you can get it loose by just wiggling it back and forth and pulling and pulling and pulling and you'll get it loose and you can get it off but it, it won't turn loose on you on its own and it won't slip off on its own which is really handy so you can trust it and uh, I've been doing it for way over 30 years uh, so I and I know it uh, I've never had one come loose or break so then we do I'm going to expand the camera out here and show you how I do this end in fact I think I'm just going to stand up because it'll be easier for me I'm, I'm going to put this over my shoulder now I don't know how you, you wear do you wear it like this or do you just put it over your shoulder Put it on the shoulder like just like what you have. Just like I like I do here. This is the way I do it, and he looks to be approximately my size, so I'm going to make it approximately you know here and and get it you know about the right height. These are a little bit adjustable. You can pull them up a little higher or a little bit lower uh, based on how you adjust it here, and you'll see that in a minute. But you know, so I'm just going to put it through the deal, and I'm going to essentially do the very same thing here. I'm going to figure out how much of a loop I need and I'm going to say about that much so I'm going to cut off the string about right here so I'll, and I'll just cut it a little bit long just to give myself a little extra actually I guess I better cut it even a little longer than that I'll cut it about down to here I'm sure that's more than I need but and of course these scissors are these are the scissors that you're supposed to tape a nickel to and throw them away. They, they, uh, and the reason you do that, you tape a nickel to them and throw them away, and then that way when a kid finds it, he's got a nickel. Because these scissors aren't worth anything. Throw those things away, right there. Make a note, throw those scissors away. Here's a little bit better pair. There you go. All right, so then bring this back up here and I'll just kind of hold it about where I think it feels good and maybe make it just a little bit looser because you can make it a little bit tighter too. Now I'm just going to take the loop off of here and kind of hold it where it's at in my hand. And then essentially I just basically do the very very same thing. I just, you know, I start wrapping a, a hangman's noose just like this toward the uh, toward the other end here toward the little end and again I want to get five or six wraps around it I think the uh, actual hangman's noose they did 13 wraps <laughs> significant number so there you go and you pull that up tight like that and then you've got an adjustable strap here so you can let this take the strap up and make it smaller or you can let it out you know and let's see how we did I may have made it too big but uh, he seems to be a pretty good sized fella so he may need it bigger I don't know um, if this is probably a little bit big but a little big is better than a little small because you can always make it smaller and then you can always pull this up here like this and make it smaller too at least on a temporary basis I don't particularly like to use them this way but like a lot of times I have small children or somebody come up want to play my mandolin well I can pull this up for them and then they it's instantly adjustable and then they can play it you know so off camera we'll fit this to him a little bit better I hope you've enjoyed the, the full meal deal setup on this uh, mandolin I think we've done just as well as we can it, it seriously plays like a dream now and it's got a pretty decent sound it just could be a little more volume would be the best thing I could say about it tone wise it's not bad so the first one of the Michaels instruments I'm gonna work on is this Martin D28 I've started taking a look at it the um, it's not set up too bad right now it's got a little bit higher action 
right now we're sitting, I'm just tuned it up, and right now we're sitting at about a little more than a hundred thousandths on the low E. About 80 thousandths on the high E. So high E is just about right. The low E is a little high. It can be a little lower. Um, beyond that, the strings need replaced. They're kind of old. And the the kind of bracing that goes along the back seam has come off where it's labeled CF Martin. So I'm going to have to glue this back in there as well. So the first thing I'll do is I'll get the strings off of here and we'll probably look at doing this first. So this is going to be kind of hard to show, but I've got this piece that goes on the back. Actually it's split into two pieces and I'm going to put glue on the on the back and then where they join and put them in there. What I'm going to do to clamp them is I'm going to put a piece of wood on top and something heavy. I've got this filler here and it's pretty heavy and that should hold it down well enough. What's wrong with it? The uh, back center seam. Uh -huh. Okay. Just making sure you didn't have a better idea. No, that's probably a good idea. I would weight it down pretty good. The only other thing you might be able to do is put a wedge in there if you can. Anything, it, boy, it, the more clamp and pressure you can get on something, the better. Yeah. That's just the bottom line. I just, if it were not the one at the sound hole, I could clamp it against the top right. or wedge it against the top, but it's the one at the sound hole, of yeah. course. You might be able to put a cross piece in there. That's a good point. That way too. The more the better, that's all I can tell you. Because clamping something flat, flat doesn't like to stick. Flat likes to float. No friend like you. You can see I went with Jerry's idea of putting a, a cross piece on here and then wedging my block down. So that should put a little bit more pressure downwards on that. Now what I'm going to do is a real light fret job. I noticed just looking at it there's one or two frets that are a little high. Um, I've already checked the neck straightness and that's all good enough. So just do a real light one here. So now that I've leveled, crowned, and polished the frets, I'm going through and cleaning up the board itself. I'm just taking a razor blade and working it back and forth. The, uh, the board itself was a little dull before, uh, a little bit grimy, so this needed to be done before I sanded the frets with you know, the high grit to polish them. And it's not a hard job, just going through and scraping the space between the frets. So I had Jerry test this saddle and we've decided that it is bone. Um, I could take some height off based off the numbers I had earlier, but I think I'll set that aside and wait until we get new strings on it. But before I do that, I'm going to bevel the ends of the bridge pins to help hold the ball end better. I'll kind of show you what that looks like. Just running it on the file and putting that bevel to it. That helps the ball end go where it should be. So 
So I did some light buffing on this guitar and now I'm going through with the Renaissance wax and just finishing up making the finish look good. I'm not putting too much on at one time and making sure I remove with a towel that doesn't isn't already saturated with the wax so it'll actually come off. But it's starting to look pretty good. So I've got some light strings I'm gonna put on here. They're just the GHS lights, phosphor bronze. This is pretty standard for what we've been using. We've been real happy with them so far. So I got this tuned all the way up to pitch and the action at the low E is at the 12 is 110 thousandths and the high E is 80. So I'm going to take some off of here. So basically I'm going to lower the strings back down to get the saddle out and mark it up. So you can see I've got Sharpie on both ends of the saddle. I'm going to mark 40 thousandths on the base side. And so if I take 40 thousandths off the saddle, that'll be 20 thousandths off at the 12. And that's going to come down to basically nothing. The high E was pretty good. I don't want to take a whole lot off of there. So I'll go knock that off and we'll put it back in here and get this tuned back up. So I've got this D28 playing really good. Um, the action is pretty low. On the low E it's sitting a little less than 90 and on the high E it is sitting about 75 and it doesn't buzz so it plays really good. It's got a really... I'm actually kind of surprised at how loud it is. And I'm not sitting in front of it but you can't really play it quiet. <laughs> Is kind of what I was thinking is I'm not hitting it very hard and it's playing louder than a lot of other guitars I've been working on so I think it's playing pretty good we got that that center bracing in the back back in there and something that occurred to me just now is I wondered if I would put that in upside down because when I'm looking in the sound hole, I can read it, but then I would think that would be upside down because you would think someone looking in should be able to read it. But I went over and looked at another Martin that we have in here, and that is the right way. It is put in the correct direction. So that's taken care of. This is all cleaned up. I'll give it one more wipe down to make sure I'm not leaving any prints or smudges, but I think we should be good here. Yeah.